Today's lesson is on the top seven tips to growing a fruit tree and also growing the world's best tasting fruits as well. The fruits and the flavors and the quality that you can't buy at stores. Floyd Zager, who we had the privilege of meeting and the founder of the Zager Fruit Orchard in Northern California, which is where the best flavored quality fruit trees are born in the United States and around the world. Floyd Zager is also known as being the most prolific stone fruit breeder of the modern era. And what he successfully accomplished is over 400 patented quality fruit trees, taking the best of fruit trees and then naturally hybridizing them, not GMO, but naturally hybridizing two amazing parents and creating these seeds from the fruit trees, eating the fruits and saving those seeds and planting on average 50,000 seeds a year and watching those seedlings grow to become mature fruit bearing fruit trees. And out of those 50,000 over the course of 10 years would only pick on average one or two to become part of those over now 400 patented fruit trees that he now has to his name. And what we are planting today are three of Floyd Zager's prized fruit trees. And these are the top picks of Tom Spellman, who is the leading educator of the Dave Wilson Fruit Nursery, who is also the leading distributor of deciduous fruit trees in the United States and the exclusive distributor of the Floyd Zager genetic fruit trees, which again are naturally hybridized taking the best of, for example, this here is a pluary called sweet tree. And pluary simply means plum plus cherry. And what it does is have the flavor of cherries, but a little bit larger like a plum. And they stick to the tree about a month long, unlike cherries that only last for a few weeks on the tree. And so you have the benefit of both an amazing plum tree with an amazing cherry tree. And again, one out of maybe 50,000 or even more, this sweet treat plural area was born and is now gonna become made a part of our garden. And that is why I'm so excited to be growing something that for one, you can't buy at the grocery store because sweet treat plural are not grown commercially. And secondly, you're gonna to get to enjoy a flavor that is picked the same day rather than what commercial orchards are mass producing are fruits that can travel and that also look good but flavor ranks pretty low on the scale when it comes to commercially grown orchard fruit trees and so today we're going to get to enjoy planting something that you can't buy at local stores that are both delicious and nutritious so if you visit the DaveWilsonNursery.com website you will find there the tom spellman top 21 picks of fruit trees that are made available through the Dave Wilson Nursery and there too you can find all the local nurseries that also purchase and offer at retail the Dave Wilson Nursery as well as the Floyd genetic fruit trees such as this sweet treat pluary but what I did is I reached out to Tom Spellman directly and I got his top three best choice Zager genetic fruit trees that we wanted to integrate into our home orchard today and the sweet treat plurie was one of them and let me share with you the others the second tree over here is the emerald drop pluot and if you come over here you can see the emerald drop pluot and the last one we're integrating into the home orchard follow me check this out the spice z nectar plum with this reddish purple foliage so it's one ornamental and second makes delicious edible fruit which we're going to get to enjoy next year so we we're excited that we were able to successfully source and find tom spellman's top three of his favorite zager genetic fruit trees and again it was an honor and a privilege to have met floyd zager with my daughter and got to enjoy a taste testing sampling 29 brand new not even yet named they were still by number um, identified fruit trees and just getting our experience and determining which ones we're going to make it to market next and i hope this encourages and motivates all of you to integrate some quality fruit trees into your home orchard as we're doing here today so let's get started so the first thing is to dig a hole 
The goal when preparing the hole is to make sure that the hole is no deeper than the depth of the container. The old style planting method required that you go twice as deep as the container and twice as wide. But the new studies on planting a tree advise that you go no deeper than the container to prevent the tree from settling deeper and further into the hole, which will contribute to another phenomenon known as stem rot. If the tree sinks an inch or two below the planting hole, so this is the soil level here in the container, we're gonna check to see where the roots flare at the top, which I see it flares right where the soil is meeting um, the tree. You can see some roots, if you wanna come in a little closer, right at that point. But if the soil was covering an inch or two over where these roots are beginning to flare out, then we may want to raise the tree a little higher. But the goal is to make sure that that flare beginning root system is only about a quarter inch covered with soil. And on average, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your plant is about an inch or two higher than the planting hole, because again, the tree is gonna settle. And if that tree settles below ground level, that is extremely detrimental to the health and the longevity of your trees. Most orchard growers will grow their trees up on mounds just to prevent the risk of what's known as stem rot. If this tree is to sink in its hole, then the soil will work its way up the tree and contribute to, again, a phenomenon known as stem rot where there's excessive moisture against the stem of the tree. So the goal when preparing your hole is to go no deeper than the container, but you can go wider as, again, another general rule for trees is that about 80 to 90% of the root system is in the top 18 inches of the soil. So don't think that the majority of the roots are gonna keep going deep, even though there may be some, the majority of the life and the health of the tree is near the top soil and in that top 18 inches of soil. And we've already accomplished just that right now. Step two is checking for root bound roots. So what we're gonna do now is remove the tree from the container. We're holding firmly against the tree trunk and then just tapping on the sides of the container and the tree should come loose like so. So as we pull the tree out, this particular grower, I can tell quickly, grew it from a smaller container into this larger container not too long ago. If we take a look at the rest of the soil here in the pot, as we back it out, you can see that there's very little to no roots in the system other than this one and these other small ones. Here's two. The plant hasn't quite filled up all of this soil. And so to demonstrate root bound roots, I'm basically going to share with you this apple tree that I've had in container for over a year now. If we take this out of the container like so, you can see that it, the roots have actually filled up the container. And it's important had this tree basically created this coil and this mesh. And you can see like there's more roots than almost soil in here, but you're going to want to basically loosen up the roots. And you can see I'm basically ripping some of that apart. And you can even go with your pruners and cut that off because if these roots are allowed to continue growing in the spiral growth that you see here, look at that ring. You can imagine one year, five years, and 10 years from now, these are all gonna girdle itself and affect the overall health and life of the tree. And this here is a, an apple tree that's still in dormancy. And when you prune the roots, it's a good practice to also prune the above ground branch structure as well to offset some of that shock. And now this plant is ready to go into its planting zone. So I wasn't expecting half of that soil mass to not be connected to the root ball. If I were to plant it now, like so, as you can see, the tree is several inches below the ground level. That's the reason I put this here to mark the ground level. And you can see the tree's too low. What we're gonna have to now do is return some of that backfill soil back into the planting hole. Notice I'm using the native soil and I know a lot of you guys are looking at this and saying, man, your soil is too good. When I dig a hole, it would take me an hour. And this soil was extremely poor when I moved in here. No one had gardened the soil for at least two decades prior to me returning to this property in 2012. And you can see that the soil here is quite amazing. Take a look here. And you can see the earthworms that are here as well. And even though there's worms, and I know we judge life of the soil by the worms, 
The life of the soil is also judged by the mycorrhiza, which is the fungal hypha that are in your soil, as well as the beneficial bacteria in your soil. And those numbers, even though we saw a couple of worms, the beneficial bacteria and the mycorrhiza are in the millions and billions. So it's that whole life that we're gonna be feeding shortly in the next steps to follow. So let's backfill some of that native soil only, not improved with compost, back into the planting hole. We're gonna add a little bit of pressure, remove any air pockets, just adding a little bit of pressure with our hands. And now we're testing the height of the tree. Still not high enough in the planting hole. Again, using our level, we can see the tree is still about an inch below the planting hole height. And we're gonna add another inch of soil. Add a little more pressure to remove some air pockets and back in the hole it goes. And now we're at the right spot. I know some of you are watching and thinking, do we now amend the soil with compost? And the answer is no, not yet. In nature, compost doesn't end up in the root ball. Compost doesn't end up below the tree and compost doesn't end up several inches below the tree. Compost is in the top layers of the soil and then the beneficial life, the earthworms, the beneficial mycorrhiza and the beneficial bacteria and water will help bring all of those nutrients into the root ball and below naturally. But to insert it below the root ball of the tree, as has previously been taught by many people and a lot of plant labels, encourage amending the soil into the planting mix when planting your tree. And that's only gonna to contribute to further plant collapse and also stem rot of the tree, shortening and affecting the overall health and life of that tree. So again, you're using your native soil because your native soil will not collapse on itself, whereas compost will quickly diminish into dust and disappear and create cavities for the tree to sink into. So we're still using the native soil around the tree and backfilling it all the way to the top. So now I'm going around the tree with my fingertips and eliminating any air pockets around the root zone. But if there's air pockets in the soil, those are areas where the roots can possibly dry out. And we wanna make sure that we apply gentle pressure around the planting hole to make sure all of those roots and the soil and the root ball are in contact with one another. And now we're creating a water ring around the tree, like so. We're gonna be fertilizing the plant. I also brought myself some compost or mulch that you can either purchase or make on your property. We're gonna add about an inch worth of compost, but we're not raising the soil around the root ball. We're basically building the soil, starting at the tree and building it up and away from the plant. So we're gonna be adding a few handfuls of compost around the tree, like so. And then what we're gonna do is fertilize your tree with the Ivory Organics All-Purpose Fertilizers, originally known as the Six Macros Plus products. Ivory Organics delivers your plants all the macronutrients plants need. Six macros being the six macronutrients include nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or the NPK that everyone, most gardeners should know. But also the six macronutrients also include magnesium, sulfur, and calcium. These six macronutrients are what plants need in abundance. And Ivory Organics all-purpose blend includes all of that in addition to it now comes with the added ingredient of azomite, which is crushed volcanic rock, which offers the plant the additional micronutrients, those trace elements that plants need in less abundance, but important for optimal health performance and maximum free yields and flavor. The Ivory Organic Super Blend has a higher NPK of NPK333, whereas the Premium Blend has a lower NPK of 222. Um, and what we're going to do is simply take a couple of tablespoons of the product and sprinkle it around the topsoil of the plant, like so. And what this fertilizer is gonna do now is feed all the beneficial life in the soil. The earthworms, the beneficial bacteria, the beneficial mycorrhiza are all going to consume it. Their populations are gonna grow. They're gonna help return those elements that are in the product to the soil to the benefit of this fruit tree here in our garden. And what we're gonna do now is simply take in our hand tool is we're gonna mix these ingredients with the compost, with this fertilizer 
into the top inch of the soil. So as you can see, the root flare is still right there. And all we're doing is simply covering it by about a fourth of an inch of soil and not more. We're making sure that the soil is not going up the tree and contributing to stem rot as the stem is supposed to be dry and it's only the root zone that's supposed to be moist. If you get too much moisture on the stem, just like cork, it'll absorb too much water and damage the underlying cambium tissues and the overall health and life of the tree. So one of the worst chores about gardening, weeding. So this is the worst year we've had in the garden with weeds. And the reason is we did not mulch for almost two years. And what mulching is, is simply adding wood chips around all of your plants and trees. This includes your fruits and your vegetables and your flowers. And what we did yesterday was we went to our local park, Griffith Park here in Los Angeles, which is a free source of product that can benefit your home garden. But if not, if you're gonna be purchasing wood chips, make sure that you buy wood chips that don't have artificial colors added to the product as that's gonna affect the overall health of your organic garden and the overall health of all the organic life that you have in your soil, which is the foundation of a healthy organic orchard and fruit and vegetable garden. And so now we're simply gonna be adding a one to three inch layer of wood chips around each of the trees and also the fruits and vegetables in our garden. And this is going to help in so many ways. The first one, it's gonna save with weeding and that's gonna save you time. It's also gonna help when you go to water the plant, it's gonna help the soil retain moisture and that's gonna save you money. Another savings is when it comes to summer highs, it's going to help keep the soil cooler. And in the winter, it's gonna serve as a blanket, keeping the soil warmer. And again, think about all that life in your soil that you're also insulating and protecting from those weather extremes. And lastly, and a question I get often is, what type of mulch do you use? And the answer is to get mulch that has the diversity of trees in it. The minerals and vitamins that went into creating these plants successfully are now being broken down by those earthworms, beneficial bacteria and mycorrhiza, and returning those elements back into the soil to the benefit of your planted fruit trees. As you come in closer, you can see that I'm being very careful not to put too many wood chips going up the tree trunk, as again, that can contribute towards stem rot. As you can see, we're keeping this protection and blanket down to like a quarter of an inch of protection. And then from there, building it up one to three inches as you get to the drip zone, which is that area below the branches is pretty much where the roots are flaring out to. And now off to the next step, watering. When watering, be sure to soak the plant and your watering patterns are gonna change, whether it be spring, summer, fall or winter. In the winter, you may water only one or zero times that entire month. If it's raining, why water the plant? Or if it's snowing, why water the plant? But in spring, you may water once a month, you may water twice a month. In a week, depending on the amount of light and heat, you may be watering once a week, and by summer, maybe even twice a week. But what you're looking for in the general rule, regardless of the season, and watching what the weather's like each week is to see what the soil is doing. And the goal is to not water the plant until the soil is dry, but never bone dry. That's the test. You wanna make sure that the soil dries between watering and that way it doesn't contribute towards root rot because if the roots are continuously wet, then that's gonna contribute towards anaerobic, which means without oxygen and without oxygen loving organisms, which are detrimental to the overall health and life of your plants. You wanna make sure you have oxygen loving organisms in the soil and that includes your earthworms and they don't like being drowned with too much water. Even though I'm continuously watering and as you take a look down below, you can see I am soaking the soil. But guess what? I'm probably not gonna be watering this plant again for another three to four days as here we are in April. We're going into an 80 degree week. So I may be watering the plant twice this week. By summer again, if the soil dries out even faster and the plant seems to be stressing out a little bit, 
we may be watering it three times a week, but you don't just water it because it's hot. You gotta watch the soil. The soil will tell you when it's time to water it again. So the next thing we're gonna do is now protect the tree with protection from damaging summer sunburn and insects and rodents using the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard, which is Armory certified for organic gardening and is also for use on your roses, fruit, nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs and healthier than latex and tar based products. And what we're going to do is simply, I've got this batch that I prepared earlier and used it on other trees earlier this week. And what we're going to do also available by the way, in colors, white, as we're using here, brown and green. If you're looking for something that's more natural looking as this tree here is a little bit more brown in color, you can whitewash it in brown. And what it's going to do is as we're going now from spring where there's 12 hours of sunlight hitting this tree trunk and there's no canopy protecting the underlying branches. And then as we go into summer, it's 14 hours of direct sunlight hitting this tree, especially on the south southwest side of the tree. What we're doing is offering a protection. While I was at the nursery, there were dozens of trees protecting one another. But here in the home food orchard, as well as in orchards across the country, these trees are exposed and standing alone. And this is an important time at the time of planting is to whitewash your trees with the ivory organics. We're protecting here the grafting wound and we're just going up the tree trunk with the products like so. And you can see how easy the product goes on. Depending on how much water you add, you can use it as a brush on. And if you add less water, you can use it as a tree paste. And with even more water, this little pint sized can can make up to five gallons of foliar spray, which is what we have here below. And this here is the Ivory Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard ready to use spray, which again, these little pint sized can, as you can read here on the back, can be used for brush on, depending on how much water you add, foliar spray with more water, and tree paste with the least amount of water. And by using the Ivory Organics brand products, we're using something that's organic compared to latex and tar-based products, we can contaminate your garden soil. And you can see we're now offering protection to the leaves, the stems, and the entire plant structure. And this will also serve as an anti-transparent, helping it with transplant shock as well. So all of these benefits by whitewashing the entire plant structure, as well as the stem, as we've just done right here. Another important time for whitewashing your plant structure is after summer harvest. If you're gonna be doing summer pruning, that'll help get the plant back in check to the right height and shape, and also maximize where those blooms are gonna be. And ultimately the blooms are gonna be where the fruit are gonna be come the following spring. So before dormancy, and again, just right after that summer harvest of fruit, you do that summer pruning and all of that open canopy and the additional light that's coming into the canopy, you're gonna to wanna to whitewash again and prevent the risk of first, second, and third degree summer sunburn as we've demonstrated many times here on the Ivory Organics Gardening Channel. So if you've enjoyed this gardening lesson brought to you by Ivory Organics, be sure to give us that thumbs up and most importantly, share us with your gardening friends and family. As always, keep growing with Ivory Organics and wishing you all happy gardening.